steadfastly tried to refuse to get into that role of a spokesperson uh, just because it's very dangerous. Uh, it makes you think that you know more than you do. And uh, it, it kills other voices that could be heard. Though he was born in California, author and activist Thomas King holds both American and Canadian citizenship. His novels, nonfiction books, radio broadcasts on the CBC, and his Massey lectures have made him an influential figure in First Nations politics. His last novel, The Back of the Turtle, he says may be his last. We cut up with Tom King in Toronto. Tom, I wanted to get the, the uh, boot licking out of the way first. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I just finished your, your most recent novel, Back to the Turtle, and uh, a couple things. I, I, I learned something out of it that I never knew before, which is always a good thing. I learned that a group of weasels is called a sneak. I never knew that. Oh. I think it's fabulous. And there is a character in the book. I was gonna, almost going to say it was like you created them just so you could describe them this way, but no, he actually does, he is a, sort of key to the plot later on. But you describe them as having a breakfast buffet face, hash brown hair, mm. egg yolk eyes, butter lips, and a short stack of pancakes for a chin. And I right. thought, man, I'll never forget that description as long as, <laughs> I, as, long as I live. <laughs> so so that, then that would lead me to ask you then, how, um, how much do you labor over those sorts of things, that kind of description? Is that something that yeah, you do? Quite a bit. What drives me nuts in the first place when I'm trying to put a piece together are names. I've got about four or five baby book names, as most writers do, I think, and I keep track of unusual names that I run into. But as I create a character, before I can even begin to describe that character, I have to have a name for them. Now, you'd think that you describe the character and then say, well, you know, what does he resemble? Is he a Ralph? Is he a John? Is he a, a Bernard? What is he? Or she, for that matter. But uh, that's not the way I work. I'll get a character. I'll say, I need a female character. I need her to be... 50 years old, what am I going to call her? And until I find a name for her, until I actually have, you know, something concrete, I can't go any further. So is it the name, so once you have the name, then do you start getting a, a, an image of what they would look like physically in your head? Yeah, uh, a lot of times I, I know what they have to do. I know what they have to do within the novel. And so I suppose I have a kind of description in my head to begin with that doesn't gel until the name comes into being. Yeah. I have to tell you that the, uh, the, the CEO of this large, unpleasant corporation that you have in this book, uh, I, I had in my head, and don't ask me why, but for the longest time, at the beginning of the book at least, up to a certain point where it all changed, the image I had in my head of this guy was sort of a, as a, a Montgomery Burns out of the Simpsons kind of guy. Oh. I didn't realize that he was a younger man, yeah. and then a waiter in a restaurant sa says, you look like James Colburn, and right. from that point on, that was the face I had in my head, was James Colbert. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's an old joke that I've been living with for years. Uh, uh, in my younger days, uh, when I wasn't quite so decrepit, uh, when I would come into town, almost inevitably, somebody at a hotel, one of the staff uh, people at the hotel would say, Oh, Mr. James Colbert, and I really love your stuff. <laughs> and uh, my partner thought, yeah, you, yeah, you're just saying that just, uh, you know make herself feel good, and she was with me at one of the big hotels in town, and the doorman opened the door and say, uh, love all your films, Mr. Colbert, <laughs> and at that point, he was dead, <laughs> and Helen so, says, I don't see it, <laughs> but okay, Yeah. and so that, that sort of stuck with me, and so when I got to the CEO, I thought, well, I'll have some fun with that, a little bit of, you know, a little autobiography yeah. thrown in there. Well, I got to say, see, in my life, when I was young, it was Paul McCartney, and then it became Eric Clapton, and then it became Michael Enright and Gwyn Dyer. Then I knew I was <laughs> sliding into <laughs> decrepitude. So. Um, but it's funny, you know, you, you talk about a, a couple of years ago in this program, we, we talked to Scott Turrell, and, and uh, just after he had written the sequel to Presumed Innocent from all those years, decades ago, mm -hmm. he wrote another book called Innocent with the same characters. It was a continuation of the story. Right. And he said that, of course, in the, in, in the interim, Presumed Innocent had been turned into a film. Right with Harrison Ford playing the Rusty Savage character. And I said, so when you're writing this book, is that the face? And he said, oh, yeah. He yeah. said, I couldn't. Now it was Harrison Ford. Yeah, you're stuck with it. And he's writing right. this book, and all he can see is Harrison Ford as his yeah. character. It's, it's yeah. peculiar. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about your, your, uh, your childhood, because you, you spent a couple of years with the Christian Brothers, the Jesuits. Did you not? In, uh, not uh, they weren't Jesuits. There no. was a Jesuit on campus, sort okay. of a, sort of a uh, what would you call it, a resident Jesuit. Okay that was on campus, but it was the Christian Brothers, okay. which aren't the Jesuits. Right. 
Yeah, it was a residential school in Sacramento, California. It wasn't a residential school like you'd have on the reserve, uh, although I suspect, having been there for two years, that uh, there were some commonalities. Uh, the brothers and I didn't get along as well as we might. Uh, partly it was, it was my problem. I wasn't Catholic. Yeah. And, but my mother thought that I'd get a good education, and I think, I think uh, somehow or other she got, I don't know how it came to pass, actually. I was perfectly happy in public school, and then bang, my first two years of high school, I'm at uh, this uh, Catholic uh, residential school, boarding school. And uh, we got into more mischief, I suppose, than was good for me. I kept running away. Well, I remember seeing a quote there. from you, and I can't remember where now. This was quite some time ago, where you said something along the lines of that half the kids in the school were juvenile delinquents and half were sent there for the same reasons that your mother sent you there, and you came out of it a juvenile delinquent. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the, the, the juvies were the more interesting people, and, uh, I mean, they would sneak out of the, the school at night and go down to K Street or go down, you know, to some part of Sacramento and, and hang out, and that was more exciting than sitting around the place. And every week... Uh, the brothers would publish the blacklist of films that you could not go and see. Well, it was well, sort of like it was like, like ringing a, a dinner handbook. bell. <laughs> yeah, it was sort of like, oh, go see these. You know, what's the number one film on the list? Let's go and do that. So it, uh, uh, I wasn't happy being there, particularly, and I was. I suppose I was looking for other things to engage me. I mean, we went to mass every day at 6, 6.30 in the morning, right. and, and, and not being Catholic, it was sort of, I just sit there, you know, dum de dum de dum de dum hungry as hell, want to eat breakfast, but you can't eat until after the rest of the guys are going to Mass and had communion, and uh, I was able to make it for two years, and it wasn't that I got a bad education there, the education was okay, but it was a pretty slanted education in many ways. There was a brother there. Whenever you got in trouble with him, he would give you the uh, choice of uh, either going in the gym and boxing around with him a little bit and, let, and giving you a chance to hit him, or uh, you'd get some kind of punishment, you know, detention, things like that. And so all of us took him up on the boxing. And the, the bugger was, a, you know, I think was worked out in golden gloves at one point in time, and uh, we never got close to him, but, oh, it was fun taking a swing. <laughs> just in case, just in case you could connect once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'd, yeah. We'd, we'd get tagged, but uh, it was okay. Yeah. We understood the risks going in. You had a few jobs that, uh, I thought it was it's interesting because... More than a few. There were, so yeah, as we all did at that, at that time of our lives, but... But yours seemed to be, there were some ser seemed to be some serendipity involved in yours. You were, I don't know, you met a woman, were you working in a restaurant, or what were you doing? You met a woman who talked about New Zealand, you end up going to New Zealand. Oh. And I, you know, it was a whole series of... Yeah, no, I was, uh, I'd gone to South Shore Lake Tahoe to work as a uh, 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 a croupier okay. on, a, on a craps table okay. and to deal blackjack. Well, most of the dealers, women, uh, most of the dealers of blackjack were women, and most of the of the uh, people who worked the uh, craps table were men. But I did both sometimes. And I met a woman who was from Australia, and she was coming away from a bad relationship, and so I was her rebound relationship, and uh, it lasted about two months, I think, something like that. But she got me interested in Australia, and to show her my love, I took out a, a visa for going to Australia. Uh, you do the darndest things when you're young. And then we broke up, but I still had the visa. And then I went back down to San Francisco, worked for an ambulance company, got tired of that, got a job in a bank, and through a crazy kind of thing, I wound up on a tramp steamer headed to New Zealand, of all places, which I thought was New Guinea. <laughs> and I was halfway across the ocean before I realized it was New Zealand and not New Guinea, and I had to change all my maps that I had bought in San Francisco. <laughs> And so I got to New Zealand, spent one year there, learned how to be a photographer, and then I thought to myself, where will I go next? And I said, oh, I've got this visa for Australia, and it's not, it's not done with yet. It's still good. And so I jumped another boat and went across from New Zealand to Australia. At one point, I thought there was a bridge that connected the two countries, because <laughs> it looks like that on the map. But anyway, it was 1,200 miles. And then I got to Australia and spent two years there. Uh, doing uh, photojournalism work and just roaming around the countryside. You see, you know, it's astonishing because when, you, when somebody reads your bio, it's like, you know, and then he worked as a croupier and then he worked as a photojournalist. Yeah. And I'm going, well, 
you know, it reminded me of a, a, a Seinfeld episode where you know George is saying, "Well, you know, I could be a manager of a baseball team, or I could be a right. You know, I could do or I, I could build box or bridges. I could split the atom. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, but these things that you went off and did, like, okay, be, becoming a croupier. But yeah. were you trained to be a croupier? Yeah, yeah. It was a two-week training course up there, and it was mostly math, which I'm not great at, and odds. So you had to figure out if somebody threw twenty bucks down on the table, and it was six to five odds. What did you pay them? And, I mean, I never studied so hard for two weeks in my life, and the, the removal rate, the failure rate on the class that went in was pretty severe, by 50%, who didn't make it through. Right. But after a while, I was able to knock those figures out of my head. And, of course, those gambling places make it easy. You can't place a $5.50 bet on the four <laughs> on a place <laughs> bet. You know, you have to place it in certain denomination, certain uh, integrals, and then uh, then it's not so hard to remember what the money payout yeah. is okay. on it. And so the, it was good. It was good. And job. the photojournalism thing? What are you just walking with a camera and say, "Hey, I can take pictures"? I was working in New Zealand. I had I had gotten to New Zealand, and uh, first job I got was going down into the forest as a deer culler, where you go in and you shoot deer for a living, because. Some fool had brought deer over to New Zealand. They had no natural enemies. They exploded like rabbits and began chewing the forest up. And so then they had to hire people to go out and shoot the little rascals and just let them sit there. But most of us had sort of contracts with the local Maoris, and we'd mark the spots, and they'd go in and harvest the deer. So it wasn't as brutal as it might have been. But I lasted at that job for about two weeks because I couldn't stand killing deer for no good reason whatsoever yeah. except the fact that they were there. So I came off of uh, that job, got a job in a beer bottle sorting plant, you know, where we picked up empties, beer bottles, and spent all day, you know, pouring all that <laughs> stuff back into the... Uh, the into glamour. The glamour. <laughs> and I saw an ad in the newspaper that said, uh, photographic assistant uh, needed, apply in person. And I had bought a camera when I was in San Francisco, and I went down to the guy's place, and I said, you know, I, I, I'd like to be considered for this job. And he says, so you've got photographic training. I said, I got a camera. I'm from San Francisco. And he says, okay, it's good enough for me. And he sent me into the dark room where his assistant was waiting for me. And he says, oh, thank God, I'm, I'm, I, I, we're swamped in here. Proof those negatives over there. And I stood in the middle of the floor, and he turned around. And he says, oh, he says, you don't know shit about <laughs> photography. And I said, I can learn, I can learn. And so he said, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to teach you how to proof negatives. And if you haven't learned it by lunch, you're fired. I said, okay, fair enough. And so I learned how to proof negatives by lunch. And after lunch, he said, okay, I'm going to show you how to print thumbnails. If you don't know how to do that by the end of the workday, you're fired. And so for about two weeks, I was there on half-day segments. The boss didn't know. It was just between me and the guy in the dark room. That was awful nice of him, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. And I, I learned very quickly. Because it meant, you know, it was either learn it or go back to the beer bottle sorting plant, and I really didn't want to do yeah. that. You you ended up in the Navy, yeah. And you ended up, uh, I guess, you ended up being 4F ultimately, did you not? Because yeah. of a because of a tragic uh, snapping of towels well, accident in a shower. Well, I'm not sure you'd call it tragic. <laughs> uh, probably asinine is a better way of describing it. No, we had come but just back from some. I would call them maneuvers, uh, if I'm being generous. It was just calisthenics on the field, really. We got into the shower, and some of the guys were, you know, they rolled the, tail, the yeah. towel up into a rat's tail and start snapping it around. And so we were leaping and shouting and snapping our towels and whatnot. It uh, seems like a scene from a bathhouse movie. And uh, I slipped and took my knee up, just tore the cartilage right out of it, went down, went to the uh, hospital at Balboa, and they looked at it. And because I had played football before and basketball and had injured the knee at one point, not badly, but it injured it, and had not put that down on my, uh, on my original form right. for going into the Navy, they decided they weren't going to fix the knee. So it was a pre-existing condition? Pre-existing yeah. condition. And they said, well, you know, you can't go on a ship. You know, you're going to have to do this. So they sent me through this triage system. And what it was was a couple of doctors who looked at the x-rays and everything else and decided whether you stay or whether they throw you out. And by that time, I had spent maybe a, maybe a month in the Navy, maybe a month and a half. I was pretty sure this was not the life for me. 
some of the guys I was, I was dealing with, some of my uh, commanding officers, were really quite frankly dumb as mud. And they had you do all sorts of stupid things for the, you know, I mean, for, for morale, you know, they'd have you do, you know, 100 push-ups in the 100 degree heat. I'm going, why are we doing this? Or they, you know, they'd have you do silly things, uh, just uh, maybe break your spirit and get you in with all the rest. I'm not sure what the idea was. I didn't like it much. So I'm sitting there in the waiting room waiting for one of the two doctors to look at my charts. And one of the guys you can hear is a lifer. He loves the Navy. And he is berating all the guys who are going through, you know, what's the, you got, you got a broken leg? Well, so what? You know, well, put a cast on it, get back and uh, go working on it. Brain trauma? Nah, don't worry about it. It's just a bump on the head. And the other guy is uh, just a civvy doctor, and he said, oh, you know, that hangnail looks pretty bad. You know, we're going to have to get you out of duty for <laughs> six months or so. And I'm going, please give me the, the civvy. And all the charts were in this one box, and the doctors would come out and pick the next chart. And I could see mine. And the lifer comes out, and he actually had his hand on my file. And then he had something else he needed to say to the guy who had just left, and he pulled the guy back, and the other guy came out, grabbed my file, brought me in. And he said, he says, you've had a little bit of university, I see. I said, yeah. He says, this knee is, uh, is not bad, but you're going to have to get it operated on. He says, what do you plan to do with your life? And I said, I don't know. I said, I thought maybe I'd go back to school. And he says, well, he says, you can have your choice. You can go back to school or you can stay in the Navy. And I said, can I be on a ship if I stay in the Navy? And he says, no. Not with a knee like that. You probably wind up doing, you know, desk stuff. And I said, well, gee, you know, maybe I just as soon go back to school. And so, stamped it. Unbelievable, though, right? Out the, the door. The twists of life. The twists of life. I mean, uh, uh, twist if I... Twists of towels, actually. Yeah, twist yes. of towels. And my brother, who normally was luckier than I am, wound up getting drafted and sent to Vietnam, and he was there for the worst of the fighting. Good God. He was there during Tet Offensive. And, really? Uh, it was Amazing. horrible. So, so you went back to school. Went back to got school, the, yep. Got, to, got your, your MA and uh, ultimately ended up at a PhD program, right? Yeah, I, had, uh, I got my BA and then I got an MA and uh, then I got a job as a counselor for Native students at the University of Utah. And while I was there, somebody said, you know, you're not doing much of anything else besides, you know, just doing that job. Why don't you think about a PhD in English? And I thought, well, hell, I got no better ideas and uh, <laughs> that sounds okay. I like English. I like reading. And, uh, which is always the danger, you know, you say, I'll take an English degree because I like reading. Well, the English degree yeah. has something to do with <laughs> reading, but... Yeah, but not a lot. Not a lot. No, no. no. So, so was it at this point that, that you started writing? When did you, when did you start writing? I, I had always written. Yeah. I was one of those kids uh, at school who would, you know, write poetry. And I ran with, uh, uh, let's call them an interesting crowd. And if they had found out that I was writing poetry, they'd killed me. <laughs> you know. Tom's writing poetry. Kill him. Um, I'd always liked literature. When I was, when I was about 14 or 15, um, high school age, I, I really had kind of a big mouth, and I'd gotten myself into some trouble with some of the local toughs. And summertime came this one year, and everybody else went off to camp. You know, the rich kids went off to camp. But it left me in town alone with his, these guys. And I was walking up the street one day, and I saw about four of them underneath the railroad tracks, underneath the bridge near the railroad tracks. And I thought, oh, God, you know, if they see me, I'm going to get my butt kicked. So I started looking around for some place to sort of dip into. Only place was the local library. I'd never been there. And, but I saw there was a door down into the basement, so I dipped down into the basement. And there were books all over the place. And so I sat down and discovered a couple of things. One, it was cool down in the basement, and Roseville was hotter than blazers. And then the librarian, after about a half an hour, the librarian came over and said, can I help you? And I thought, here's where I get kicked out of the library. And I looked outside through one of the windows, and the guys were still there. And I thought, you know, this is it. And uh, she said, would you like to read a book? And I said, oh, I love books. Yeah, sure. And so what kind of books do you like? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, uh, should, do you like horse and dog books? Sure, okay. <laughs> and so she went to the shelf, and she got me a copy of one of Thomas C. Hinkle's books. And uh, I read it. I read part of it there. I thought, this, this isn't bad. You know, it's a lot better than being outside in the heat with those guys under the bridge waiting for me. And so I began going to uh, the, uh, uh, the library um, every day that summer. 
just over and over and, and over again. And reading. Yeah. And reading. So. so you spend the summer reading books in this library, in the coolness of the library. Yeah. Yeah. You start thinking, maybe I could do this too? Is that where the no, germinated? No, huh? I, just, uh, I just liked reading, and so I read my way through the shelves uh, for the next couple of years. That's how I spent my summers, is uh, reading books in the library. Um, I don't think, I mean, I, I was writing poetry at the same time, but it was, you know, doggerel stuff, you know, I love you, you love me, the sky is blue, blah, blah. blah. Um, I didn't really try my hand at writing in a real way until I was in Australia working for a magazine there as, a, as that photojournalist. And there I wrote a, a kind of a Penny Dreadful's spy novel, Russian spies on an American campus chasing down American astronauts, blah, blah, blah. It was, uh, it was pretty horrible. I forget what it was called and I've lost the manuscript, thank God. And then I did, uh, I did uh, nonfiction work at the magazine writing stories. Some of the stories were just as, as, as bad as you could possibly think. <laughs> because I was uh, American, because I was, at the time I was American, because I was uh, American Indian, they sent me on all of these nutso jobs. Uh, I got to take a chimpanzee around Sydney, and they took pictures of me and the chimp as I'm showing the chimp the sights. And they, Who the hell's story idea was that? It was my editors. <laughs> But the worst, the worst was they, they had me take around a blow-up dolly. Honest what? to God. Yeah, they got this dolly from this mail-order catalog, dressed her up, and it was my job to take her on a date. And they photographed Good me. Good God. I know, this, I know. This is, were these people on drugs? I, the, the most embarrassing bizarre. part is she sprung a leak <laughs> down around her thigh. We had to take her to a gas station and lay the vinyl... <laughs> thing out and then put a patch on her and then pump her back up again and we got all sorts of really <laughs> strange looks and I don't blame the people no for kidding. thinking we were crazy but I, I have pictures of the thing I still have that article in my scrapbook just wow. so my kids can you know look and see just how hard this writing life really was <laughs> you said once that you've never started a novel that you haven't finished yeah yeah. Writing, that is, as opposed to reading. Yeah. Um, which is why I don't have many novels <laughs> out. <laughs> but, but uh, uh, which doesn't, uh, doesn't suggest, I don't suppose, that you can, that you sit down and, and, and do one work all the way through. I know, I remember Mordecai Richler telling me once that uh, one of his novels he'd worked on for several years and he couldn't get past a certain point and he put it away yeah. and, and wrote an entirely different novel. Yeah had it published, did the tour, did all the stuff that he was obliged to do, then went back and finished the other one. Yeah. You ever done anything like that? Yeah. Um, what, what happens with me is I'll start an idea for a novel and I'll go so far into it to see if it has legs, to see if I actually can see a novel out of that. If I can't, then I just put it off to one side and I may never see it again. Uh, in other instances, such as The Back of the Turtle, the, the new novel, yeah. um, I started off with the first chapter that first long chapter where Gabriel is on the rocks uh, trying to commit suicide and he begins pulling people out of the ocean. That, uh, I had that chapter. I liked that chapter. My partner liked that chapter. And for two or three years, I couldn't do anything past that chapter. And so I did other things. I did a children's book. I did mystery. I you know, did a collection of short stories. And I kept saying, I can see the rest of the novel, but I can't make this piece work. I'm going to have to get rid of it. And Helen kept saying, no, don't get rid of it. It's a good piece. It's a good piece. And she said, just keep thinking about it. And so I kept thinking about it. And my question was, what do I do with the people that I got out of the ocean? I had no idea. You know, I had this wild idea about these people coming out of the ocean. And I thought, well, it can't be mytho mythological. Well, I thought they were an hallucination of his. That's yeah. what I thought when I first read it. And, and, and they, they could have been, but at some point I would have had to have done something with them and I had no idea what I was, what I was going to do with them. And then one day I was just walking around the house and I thought, wow, I can do that with them. And as soon as I said that, then the rest of the novel just fell into place. It does, and it just comes. Yeah, it just, yeah. It just comes. Yeah. And it was, uh, it, I won't say it was easy, but... Uh, and w w with a character like Nicholas Crisp, who I just love, yeah, you know, it was all I could do to keep from writing crisp chapters. I know. Yeah. Well, I kept thinking of Long John Silver the whole time. Yeah, that's what I thought yeah. he sounded like, you know. Yeah. The, you, I want to ask you in our last few minutes, but I want to ask you about the, the use of humor. 
because this book, while, while the subject matter is quite grim, yeah. is not a grim book at all. In fact, it's a quite hopeful book. It ends yeah. in a hopeful, a hopeful note even. Uh, but I had a quote from you from an interview that you did somewhere else. You said, what I try to do is get people laughing so they don't think poorly of me for having taken a piece off their hides. Yeah. Um, you've long used humor that way. Yeah, yeah. Humor for me is uh, is, is a strategy for dealing with, you know, uh, less than humorous subject. Uh, what I find is that uh, you've got to be careful with tragedy. You put too much of it into anything, and people turn away from you. No, no matter how important it is that they understand what's happening, they mm -hmm. they turn away. They turn away because it just gets too much to bear, and so. My strategy always has been to use a little bit of humor to, to supposedly leaven the tragedy, but actually what you do is you sharpen it. You deepen the tragedy. And so while people are laughing at a situation that is basically tragic, uh, at some point all of a sudden they realize that, oh, that's not funny at all. But by then it's too late. Yeah. Too late. You've yeah. gotten in close. You've gotten that piece off their hides. Do you feel, it's funny, I was, I was re-watching uh, an interview we did a couple of years ago with uh, Lawrence Paul Yawalapton, the artist, mm -hmm. and he said to me, uh, he said, I don't need, he said, I can speak for myself. I don't need Greenpeace speaking for me as a uh -huh. native person. I don't yeah. need David yeah. Suzuki. I can, I, I can speak for myself. Yeah. Um, do you, are you seen in, in parts of the, of the Native American, Native Canadian community as a, a voice? of Indians, or are you just another writer who happens to be an Indian? I think I'm just another writer who happens to be an Indian. The last thing I want to be is a spokesperson. I'll tell you why. is because if you set yourself up like that, then everybody comes to you because you're there, you're available, uh, and then they don't hear any other voices. And so what I try to do when people come and say, hey, will you talk about uh, on-reserve gambling, uh, a spousal abuse, uh, alcoholism, all the some of the, the, the hot button items that uh, the media likes to, uh, likes to play around with vis-a-vis -vis Native people. I say, look, you know, I, I don't live on a reserve. You know, if you want to know about that, go and talk to the people who do live there, yeah. you know, who have some real knowledge of that. And uh, I've, I've steadfastly tried to refuse to get into that role of a spokesperson uh, just because it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes you think that you know more than you do. Yeah and uh, it, it kills other voices that could be heard. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this novel, and I, I re really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thanks oh, a lot. It's been great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. See you again another 20 years, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>